So let's look at this history. History first. The patient is 10 year old boy presented to emergency department with bleeding in posterior oropharynx seven days post tonsillectomy. On a physical examination, patient is lethargic, pallor, decreased capillary refill, vitals are 140 per minute. 70 by 40 is BP, 97 saturation, respiratory rate 25 per minute. And the patient is accompanied by a mother who stated the bleeding started two hours ago after the child ate a sandwich. So let me highlight you some points that it is the seven day. Okay. So this is the seven day post tonsillectomy. Okay. Lethargy, pallor, decreased capillary refill. These are the keywords. Then tachycardia, hypotension, normal saturation, tachypnea, and two hours NBM status. Okay. So from here, I can see few important points. That is the post-op day. This is the post-op day seven. Another thing, signs of dehydration. Okay, next is hypotension and tachycardia and inadequate NBM status, tachypnea. These are all signs. Okay, so this history is related with post tonsillectomy hemorrhage. And post tonsillectomy hemorrhage you can get in your exams practicals md da whatever okay as a short case or long case so the most common question they ask is what are the dds of this case the history i've shown just now first dd is post tonsillectomy hemorrhage second is trauma next is coagulopathies and if they ask you which one, then von Willebrand disease. 1% cases, which is factor 8 deficiency. Okay. Another is, is spontaneous and last one is epistaxis. So these are the DDs and in which we will be studying in detail about the post tonsillectomy hemorrhage, which is the diagnosis of the history I just showed you. So post, -tonsillect ham post tonsillectomy hemorrhage you will define as first is primary and second tree bleeding. Okay. First is primary bleeding and secondary bleeding. In the history we just saw it was post of day seven. Okay. So if it occurs in less than 24 hours, it is primary bleed. And if it is occurring more than 24 hours or after the 24 hours in the post operative day from five to seven, it is a secondary bleed. The next question they will ask, what are the causes of primary bleed? Why it is happening? It happens because of inadequate surgical hemostasis. Okay, that's why ENT surgeon intraoperatively ask for Valsalva menu. Okay, Valsalva bag and mask so that they can check the bleeding points. And for secondary bleeding, the reason is when fibrin uh, fibrin clot or you can see the S char sloughs off the tonsillar bed. So after this, the important topic is the risk factors. And as we saw in the history, the patient was the patient was 10 year old male. So now the risk factors are age gender in which males are more common age you can say up to 13 years or older age sex and then recurrent if the patient is having any history of recurrent tonsillitis 
और पेरीटोंसिला बैड पेरीटोंसिला एप्सेस ओके क्वेगुलोपैथीज बॉन विलब्रेन डिजीज ओके सो दीज आर ऑल द डिस्क फैक्टर्स विच वी ऑल्सो सॉ इन द हिस्ट्री अनदर थिंग okay post tonsillectomy bleeding we saw the bp of the patient the patient was hypotensive the patient was having tachycardia tachycardia hypotension means the patient was hemodynamically unstable and for that we need to optimize the patient before the ot so why is it dangerous actually why is it dangerous or what challenges as an anesthetist you can have first is hypovolemia these patients are hypovolemic hypovolemia and another is the patient will be having low cardiac output the patient will be having airway obstruction due to previous intubation yes and there is a risk of aspiration due to inadequate nvm status and this can lead to spasm laryngospasm okay and hypovolemia and low cardiac output can lead to hemorrhagic shock so they can ask that what are the <coughs> what are the complications related to it and then about the hemorrhagic shock so hemorrhagic shock is actually divided into four classes first is according to the total blood volume loss first second third and fourth the first is if the loss is around 15% second is 15 to 30% 30 to 40% and then more than 40% and if they ask you in ml around 750 ml in first class 715 to 1500 then 1500 to 2000 so accordingly we can see whether the patient is in severe shock or class 1 shock or 3 class class 3 shock etc okay so we saw we have uh, already assessed the patient okay we did the pac now what we have to do we have to check the ot so the examiner can ask what preparations you will do before taking this patient into the ot first of all we have to see all the asc standard monitors should be available another like uh, ecg edco2 okay pulse pulse oximeter nibp and temperature probe next thing we should have bt set for blood transfusion or warmer and warm fluids okay we should have double double suction setup multiple size et tubes why multiple size et tube so if the according to age of the patient if we are using 4.5 mm ett or if you have used 4.5 induced with the 4.5 mm ett in the previous uh, operation then now you have to have at least 4 mm or 3.5 mm at least two <coughs> smaller etts two small size etts should be kept ready why this is happening because due to the previous intubation your airway which was like this might have become like this due to edema 
ओके देन एमरजेंसी एयरवे कार्ड शुड बी रेडी विच इंक्लूड्स वीडियो लैरिंगोस्कोप एटसेट्रा ट्रेक्योस्टमी सेट ओके ट्रेक्योस्टमी सेट शुड बी कैप रेडी एंड टेम्परेचर ऑफ द ओटी शुड बी ऑप्टिमाइज्ड so uh, before taking the patient into the ot you should be prepared with these things the most important among them is multiple size etd from which they can ask you about the airway huh? and warmer for hypothermia and double suction setup tracheostomy for in case you are not able to intubate the patient then you have to do tracheostomy with the help of ent surgeon or your senior now you have did the psc you have checked your ot you have checked all the instruments everything you have checked the reports in which you have checked hemoglobin platelets inr everything and you have confirmed the identity and nbm status of the patient you have taken the consent okay done so after these things the next question you will be asked is about the plan of anesthesia how will you induce the patient okay how will you induce and how will you extubate the patient okay so now we all know that the pediatric age group has low frc so we have to kept in mind about the adequate pre oxygenation to get the adequate reserve because this can be difficult intubation so in induction we can induce the patient with iv propofol ketamine or etomidate so if the patient is hemodynamically stable we can use these two but in our history it was given that the bp was 70 by 40 then we do not prefer propofol <coughs> we can prefer ketamine and etomidate okay uh, to know more about these drugs you can check out in my playlist about the drugs induction agents so we give the patient ga and then we will do rapid sequence intubation rapid sequence intubation with cricoid pressure so uh, we want to refer rapid sequence intubation because in the history we saw the patient is full stomach okay so this will be the preferred technique cricoid pressure is also known as salix maneuver and then they can ask you about what is salix maneuver what is the uh, how much newton pressure will you give in pediatric population etc also beforehand Uh, before inducing the patient you should insert a nasogastric tube so that you can suction out the blood if the patient has swallowed some blood so you can suction out that okay so we did the adequate pre oxygenation and then we will put the ng tube and then we will induce the patient okay with either ketamine or etomidate and then we will do the rapid sequence intubation in maintenance we can use sevo sevofluran and in sorry i didn't tell you about the muscle relaxants what muscle relaxants we can use rocuronium and succinylcholine you can use both you can use any one of them and also you have to suction out the blood here i am talking about the suction it should be done under vision okay so that you can literally see the clots and then you can remove them another thing the examiner can ask is about the analgesia what analgesia will you prefer in these patients first of all uh, these patients were already post op so they must be given some fentanyl or opioid okay some fenta or opioid so there will be some 
residual narcotic effect left in these patients so now this time when you are taking the patient for the second time you should use very low dose or preferably short acting opioids and also pcm is preferred around 15 mg per kg you can give for analgesia done now we have to extubate the patient so remember you always have to extubate the patient awake after the laryngeal reflexes have gone done the last question they can ask is although they can ask anything but one more question they can ask is when to discharge the patient when you can say that yes the patient can go home okay so they say that you must shift the patient from ot to picu first and for about 24 hours at least so that the patient can be in observation and via shifting also you have to shift the patient on monitors in left or right whatever lateral position recovery position okay and with supplemental oxygen with supplemental oxygen with all the emergency medication and airway equipments etc so during shifting you have to keep in mind about this that the patient should be shifted in lateral position with oxygen always oxygen support and there is one pacu discharge criteria also so if they ask you what is that so for patient under 13 years of age they give a separate pacu discharge criteria in which uh, the criteria components of criteria is bp heart rate saturation respiratory rate plus you can remember is like whether the patient is a fully awake or still sedated okay the patient should not be having any fever and patient should be an adequate urine output if the uh, psu discharge criteria is met only then and then you can discharge the patient so thank you for listening keep watching if you like this video please like follow subscribe and share it among your study groups